nobody really should be overly super confident the very first time they do anything because if you are that's not really confidence that's just you know fluff and and you're faking yourself and you know whatever you got to do we all have to start somewhere but the biggest thing is as you're growing or as an entrepreneur you're passionate about what you're doing it is very easy to always see yourself as the smartest guy in the room you know, and want to remind people of that. And I've been, I've been around so many inventors, so many, you know, talented, smart people who, who had some really great concepts, ideas, even products, or even developing brands. But the problem is they were adamant about making sure that everybody, you know, within earshot and beyond always knew that they, and only they were the smartest person in the room who knew everything. And my thing is, if that's the case and you're the smartest person in the room, then why would you have anyone else in the room? You know, do it yourself and save a lot of money. I, I mean, I've said that to people for years, business partners, people who work for me. I've said, if I could do your job for you, if I knew how to do it or had the time, the bandwidth, the skill set to do it, I would. And I wouldn't pay you. I'd save the money. I'm not doing it for charity. I'm not paying you for the fun of it. You know, you know you, you're you here and we're doing this together, however we're doing it, whatever our roles are, because you provide a benefit to me. And, and you know, in exchange, I'm compensating you in a way that is you know, agreeable, fair to that. It helps me succeed more. But if you're not adding that value and I'm so much freaking smarter than you at all of these different things, then I'd have to be a bigger idiot. You know, I, I just think anyone who thinks they're the smartest guy in the room is really the biggest idiot in the room. This episode is sponsored by Classical Conversations. Since 1997, Classical Conversations has been equipping families like yours with the resources to homeschool with confidence following a classical curriculum rooted in a Christ-centered worldview alongside other families in a local community. Homeschooling is doable with Classical Conversations. Check out classicalconversations.com forward slash Gibbons for more information. Again, that's classicalconversations.com forward slash Gibbons, G-I-B-B-E-N-S. EQ Gangster, what is going on? I am here with this bad of the bone, high-speed, low-drag, air-cooled, belt-fed, Teflon-coated, Drew Black, and this guy is the bee's knees. So check out this guy's bio. So he's the author of his new book, Under My Skin, He's an Emmy-nominated producer and founder of the Launch DRTV agency, where he has created and directed award-winning TV broadcast commercials for major celebrities, including Jennifer Lopez, Serena Williams, Cindy Crawford, Ellen Pompeo, Dwayne Wade, Kristen Davis, Jane Seymour, Paris Hilton, Drew Brees, and a whole truckload more. In addition, he's the founder and CDO, which I also love. Not chief dope officer, but chief dude officer, which is awesome, of the skincare line Derm Dude, which produces products specifically for men's beards, balls, and tattoos. They're the primary 2022 sponsor for NASCAR driver Spencer Boyd. He's also co-founded Global Mobility USA, a nonprofit that delivers wheelchairs to people in need. He's got an engaged audience of more than almost 60,000 TikTok followers. 20,000 followers on IG and just over 5,000 email subscribers. He lives in SoCal with his four awesome kids and his dog, Rufus. Check him out on social. And I'll make sure to have all the links and stuff to his book and bio and links and all that stuff on our show notes. Um, so, Drew, dude, it's good to have you, bro. All right, gangster, man. Your energy, man. You're like a DJ, too, man. When you do that lead in, it's like, man, you could have knocked off like any other DJ and had that spot, brother. <laughs> awesome. True, man. I'm super stoked, man, to learn about you, hear about your story and your journey, man, your, your business journey, your emotional growth journey, the ups and the downs, whatever you're willing to talk about, yeah. you know, so, so with, with that, all that amazing bio, right. That incredible bio and stuff. It's like an what? ADD bio. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 
<laughs> Which no diagnosis I, needed. <laughs> dude, I, dude I, I, I'm one of the OGs of ADD, bro. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I always look, they used to do these commercials like years ago, like the pharmaceutical ones, like if your brain functions like this and they'd show like flashes and snowy screens and things jumping all over and like, you may need medication, like you could be AD. And I'd be like, oh, that's so calming. Why would I want to change that? Like, right. that's like, <laughs> oh, like. That's like my bio. Like I'm, I'm, I'm good, man. I don't. That's anything. right. <laughs> That's awesome. So, what do you think has contributed the most to who you are today? Life's experience. You know, it's it's life, and it's funny. You know, growing up, man. I mean, you know, when you're 15, you start to become like more aware. 16, you think you know everything. It's like kind of the first time in your life where you have an attitude, probably, or a real attitude, and then you're 20 and 25 and you know, shit, by the time you're 30, you, you think that you've been around the world three times and, and you've known everything there is to know and you're already looking back and, you know, with, with wisdom. And then, but, you know, it's, it's, at least for me, man, it's, it's, it's been with every, you know, decade, every year, um, I just grow that much more um, emotionally, mentally. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say intelligently because there's way too many people out there that know me and can call bullshit if I try to say intelligent. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll leave that one out, but for sure, like life's experiences, you know, I remember like someone asking, you know, a musician, uh, you know, uh, about, you know, their best songs and when their best songwriting was. And, and, you know, they said, oh, it's, it's now, you know, the musician was like in their fifties or sixties. And they said, because I've lived more, I can write more about life. I've lived life. I've had more experience. And like musically, I could, I could well when I was 20 and 25 and, you know, my arms didn't get tired and like he was a guitarist and, you know, I could play for eight hours without needing to pit, you know, it was like all these different things. Like, but, but lyrically and, and, you know, songwriting, um, you know, he was saying, you know, later in life, the older he got. And I, I think that to me, that's the answer to your question is, you know, I'm constantly, you know, looking back like, man, whether I loved it or not, I learned a lot from that. You know? Yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly right. No, that's great. That's great perspective. So, you know, you've been you've done some amazing things, met some amazing people doing some amazing things. What has contributed to your your emotional endurance as an entrepreneur, right? I, you know, we talked before we started recording that just the, the entrepreneur journey is, is brutal. And, and a lot of folks talk about, Hey, I'm have the greatest widget or I have the greatest, whatever idea, but that's, that's not even like, if, if you can't survive the entrepreneur journey, it doesn't matter how cool your widget is. How yeah. did you develop that emotional uh, endurance and stamina and resilience to to go through all that you've been through no it's it's a good point and and yeah there's like the widget factor you know and it's funny and, and not to knock that but i mean you know it's not even a dime a dozen it's a dime a thousand i mean and and the and the idea is you know i've never met someone who doesn't have ideas you know i, I have people who come up to me every successful brand i've been a part of someone always is always more than one, oh man i thought of doing that once and i didn't damn you beat me to i'm like yeah, because all it took was like an idea in 20 minutes, right? <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I'm not trying to like knock people down. But but the, the real part about, you know, being an entrepreneur isn't, you know, so that you can walk around at parties or on your business card. If, if you still have business cards and write, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't think you really care. I never thought of myself as, as such. You know, I, I, I never gave myself titles or labels. I mean, there were times along my business career that people on my team and advisors and would say, hey, man, we, we got to introduce you somehow. You know what? You know, and that, that's why when we started Derm Dude, I was like, "Hell, man! I, my company, my brand, my idea. I get to call. I'm going to be the chief dude officer. You know, fuck it. Nobody can say no." But for years, I would be introduced as just you know, guy with good ideas, and I was you know the owner and founder and you know creative lead of a, a pretty successful agency in Los Angeles. But I didn't, I didn't you know want or need or care for titles like creative director or junior senior creative director or lead copywriter or you know even even you know a lot of things I was known for was directing, you know, celebrities and athletes and high end commercials. And I just never really introduced myself or referred myself to as a director. I just, it wasn't something that, that I needed the title or cared about it. I was, I was more into the the journey. I was into storytelling. I was into, 
you know, the, the work, the creativity, um, you know, more than the resume of it. Um, and I, I think I'm, I'm fortunate for that. And I think, I think going back to your very initial question, I think if, if that's how you're wired, then I think you have, you know, a good foundation to consider, you know, being an entrepreneur because you're not measuring yourself, you know, paycheck to paycheck, meeting to meeting, you know, you don't live for affirmation 24 seven because, you know, a true entrepreneur is going to live in a world of far more failures than successes. The difference is going to be, you know, do you, how do you define those failures? You know, m most people see the word fail. Um, I failed at something and they, they think it's just, what a disaster, you know, erase it. This was a horrible, terrible time. And I never felt that way. And it wasn't until fairly recently, someone shared their acronym with me for the word fail. And it was, you know, F-A-I-L. And they referred to it as first attempt in learning fail. And, you know, I was glad to hear that as simple as it was, because it described what my own natural philosophy has been, you know, all these years, I, I would always look back and, and reference either the, the jobs or the projects or the campaigns or instances in life that, that sucked. And I really didn't enjoy some of them. And I would attribute some of those for sure, many of them to what led to my biggest successes as well, what I learned from them, what I was able to take away and what I was able to then apply constructively versus, you know, living in a world of woe is me, why, you know, why didn't the sky open up and $10 million from this project land on my lap? That's isn't that what being an entrepreneur is? No, it's not. <laughs> you know, it's uh a big part of it is the the 15th or 50th time you get knocked on your ass getting up as quick as you did the very first time. That's in my mind, being an entrepreneur. Man, I, I love that. I love that. I do. I have, a, I have a teleprompter. So that was word for word. I, 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 <laughs> it's all scripted. We have, yeah. we have a really good creative director here. You know, <laughs> That's right. Speaking of titles, right? <laughs> right. Right. I didn't want to step on any toes. The junior creative director and the senior creative director are off to the side and they're just updating it. But, That's you know, right. but I, I could speak it because I've lived it. It's just, it's just a story in my life, man. And, and I'm sure yours and, and, and other entrepreneurs watching this. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and you fail far, far more often than, than you succeed at. And my, my defensive game is pretty good because I've spent six and a half years I've been doing Jiu Jitsu in in uncomfortable bad positions because I'm bigger than than most people that I roll with, so I let them start in a dominant position, and and so I I'm, I'm very comfortable now in very uncomfortable positions, and I think man that's that's very much like being an entrepreneur. Most of the time we are in very uncomfortable positions in business and life and negotiations and business partnerships and whatever else, and it's like okay, how can I navigate through this particular uncomfortable situation? in a way that uh, maximizes the outcome for everybody involved in a, in a positive way. And sometimes you win. And, and a lot of times, you know, you get tapped out and you just, okay, well, let's, let's roll to the next, the next opponent or, or whatever. So no, that's great. I love that. And, and the key when you're in those tough positions, you know, I was gonna say is I'm sure, you know, it's keep breathing and trying not to panic. And that's, you know, obviously at some point, if the dude chokes you out, you're no longer breathing. But I mean, up until that point, you know, if you start panicking, like, oh, oh shit, uh, I shouldn't have done that. I should have done this. Well, instead of actually executing what your next move should be, you're dwelling right now in, in, you know, the past. And there's a time to review, you know, what I did, what I could have done differently, what I could have done better. I think that's critical. I think if you don't do that, on, on, on most things, you know, business wise, then, then you're missing out on, on really what the keys are to some of your future biggest successes, but there's a time and a place. And when the game's still on, you know, it's not to go back in history. It's to say, okay, what do I do now? Do I go left, right, straight over the wall, under the wall? Do I blast through the wall? You know, pick, don't be indecisive. I always tell people that may, uh, no choice is a choice. You know, I talk about that in my book. Um, you know, uh, under my skin, which is that, you know, the, the easiest decisions in life um, are easy. They're, they're not like hard to make, you know, so someone's like, oh, I picked that one. Isn't that great? Well, like a thousand people out of a thousand people would have chosen that one. Um, you know, the real decisions in life and business and, 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 and business relationships and personal relationships that matter the most, that make the biggest difference I've found, usually it's not between a good or a bad or an easy or a hard decision, or it'd be an easy decision. It's usually between shit or shittier. 
I've got two pretty bad options. Neither one of them is where I really want to go right now. So do I freeze up and say, man, these both suck? Or do I have what it takes to keep breathing, keep steering the course, you know, moving forward and saying, all right, sometimes you got to choose between shit or shittier. Which one is going to get me back where I need to be the fastest or cause me the less, the less damage in the process? And that's not an easy, intuitive thing for people to do, you know? Yeah, no, that's a that's an excellent point. Can you, okay, so that's a, that that kind of leads you to another good question here. What would be one principle, one of the most helpful principles that you share in your book that you would like to share with the audience? Man, there's there's quite a few. Um, I, I would say one thing in particular for me is that you know always try to surround yourself with people so that you're the dumbest guy in the room. You know, especially as an entrepreneur. Um, Look, you know, being insecure, lacking confidence is not a sin. It's it's human nature. Um, the more experience and the more skill you get under your belt, the more practice time, you know, the more confident you should be and will be. You know, nobody really should be overly super confident the very first time they do anything, because if you are, that's not really confidence. That's just, you know, fluff and and you're faking yourself and, you know, whatever you got to do, we all have to start somewhere. But the biggest thing is as you're growing or as an entrepreneur, you're passionate about what you're doing. It is very easy to always see yourself as the smartest guy in the room, you know, and want to remind people of that. And I've been I've been around so many inventors, so many, you know, talented, smart people who who had some really great concepts, ideas, even products or even developing brands. But the problem is they were adamant about making sure that everybody, you know, within earshot and beyond always knew that they and only they were the smartest person in the room who knew everything. And my thing is, if that's the case and you're the smartest person in the room, then why would you have anyone else in the room? Mm. You know, do it yourself and save a lot of money. I, mm. I mean, I've said that to people for years, business partners, people who work for me. I've said, if I could do your job for you, if I knew how to do it or had the time, the bandwidth, the skill set to do it, I would, and I wouldn't pay you. I'd save the money. I'm not doing it for charity. I'm not paying you for the fun of it. You know, you know, you, you're here and we're doing this together. However, we're doing it, whatever our roles are, because you provide a benefit to me and, and, you know, in exchange, I'm compensating you in a way that is, you know, agreeable, fair to that. It helps me succeed more, but if you're not adding that value and I'm so much freaking smarter than you at all of these different things, then I'd have to be a bigger idiot, you know, I just think anyone who thinks they're the smartest guy in the room is really the biggest idiot in the room. Yeah, that's, I love it. How did you develop your humility, Drew? You know, trial and error and lots of failure. I mean, that's the honest truth. Um, I'd never overly, um, look, I'm not saying that, that losing or failing at something is fun. But there is a way to look at it. There is a, a mental fortitude you can have. There is perspective and it does matter. You know, objections are a part of life. A lot of people do not handle objections very well, whether it's in a pitch meeting, business, dealing with finance, a bank, lenders, investors. It could be something as simple as a personal relationship, asking somebody out, or it could be, you know, a, a salesperson doing some basic sales stuff on a car lot or something. And, you know, human nature is that I don't think that we're really taught from a, culturally to understand objection and, and how to really react in a healthy way to it. We just naturally get angry. We tense up, we get defensive. Um, that is natural for 99% of all people. And, and, you know, I was always, yeah, I used to joke around, but I would refer to myself early on as, as my role, talk about titles. I would refer to myself as a student of human behavior. And I guess it's a fancy term for people watching now, but I would, I would love being in meetings or rooms or situations, whatever it was where I was a fly on the world war fly on the wall. And I could be anonymous and uh, had a lot less tattoos and not a huge beard. And I just, you know, took up a lot less space. So I could be more anonymous then. And, and I would watch and observe and just found that there were so many fascinating things to pick up on and learn and take away just by observing what was really happening. And the one thing that I realized over time and it happened over jobs, I talk about in the book, you know, a stint in the telemarketing world, which is, you know, almost as soulless as any job you can have of rejection and negativity and people hanging up on you day in and day out. And 99% of the things you do that day are going to end up with don't call me again, click. But 
But, you know, somehow I kind of figured out my own way. And, you know, it's like 25 years ago, I was making five, six grand a week, you know, telemarketing, selling newspapers over the phone, even with all of that rejection. And at the same point, most of the other salespeople around me were crippled by that rejection. It would be, you know, six, seven rejections in a row, 20 rejections in a row, man. And they were ready to jump out of a building. And, and you know, and I get it. I mean, that, that's kind of more of a what you would expect in human nature. But for me whether it was gamification, whether it was Jedi mind trick, I used to refer to it, you know, if I got hung up on 10, 15 times in a row, my mind went to, all right, man, I am 15 times closer to this next deal. I got the bad ones out of the way, you know, and, and, you know, I, I remember um, reading about Thomas Edison, the inventor from the great nation of New Jersey, um, you know, uh, and, and I, you, you know, just read about him. And I always thought what was cool is, is, I mean, he invented some great things and, you know, the light bulb and all these different things. But one of my favorite things is when he talked about how many times in life he had inventions that didn't pan out, that didn't come to fruition, that didn't get patented. And someone once asked him and said, you know, you have failed at over 10,000 things. You know, how do you, how does that make you feel? How do you look at that? And his response was, you know, I don't, see that I failed at 10,000 different things. I see that I found 10,000 different ways to do something better or differently. And, and those, those are the types of things that really have, have driven me, you know, examples like that, that I, I believe very much in it. It's worked for me at least. I, I love it. In, in fact, I, I would, I would almost argue, and you didn't directly say this, your telemarketing experience prepared you to be a successful entrepreneur, in my opinion. Oh, I talk about it in the book. I mean, it, it was one of the most um, helpful experiences in the world. And there were days, I mean, nobody's, you know, perfect or everyone's human where I, I, I drove a, a Jeep Cherokee at the time and it had something like Jeep or something written on the steering wheel and, and as the as the logo, like on the thing. And later that evening, someone's like, what's that on your forehead? And it looked like a couple of letters. It's like, it's like a J and E what's and in the middle of the day I'd been out in the parking lot just banging my head into the I mean I had a particular you know so I, I'm not saying that every single minute of every single day you know I'm able to like smile sunshine out of my ass I mean you know and be real with yourself about that you know it's like we're human beings but once you have you know uh, an awareness you're gonna you know have to manage your emotions, rein it in sometimes, sometimes you do it better than others, but be aware. Awareness is one of the most critical things. I think that would have been a bigger issue for me if that time where I was just in a bad day and maybe I had other things going on in life at the time, I don't know, whatever, you know, it was 25 years ago, but my concern looking back is not that I did that and banging my head into a steering wheel when I was so pissed off. It would have been if I wasn't aware or cognizant that that's what I was doing. And if that was a repeat pattern where every time in my life, something didn't go my way, I was banging my head into something. Um, so, and it, it, fortunately it's not, you know, that was a big deal. I mean, I was a TV news producer for a brief window of time and, you know, I, I had some success, but I did not come nearly close to what my original definition of success was. So at the time it was something that I considered a huge failure and a huge change of course in life. And, and certainly as the years went by, looking back, that played an enormous role in helping me where I was supposed to be. You know, it's a journey. It's like you're, you're driving the bus and you're picking up all of this wisdom and knowledge and experience along the way every time your bus stops. And even though you might pick up some stuff that looks like junk and is not what you wanted to be picking up, the reality is if you look at it with the right lens and you're thoughtful and you're aware um, and you're honest with yourself and you don't let yourself bullshit yourself, most of the things that you do and experience in life are going to be beneficial if you can look at it the right way and take the good from it and leave the bad behind great skinny drew just some great great thoughts there how did you develop your self-awareness you know it's it's a good question I, th I think it it almost comes back to something we talked about previously which is not to be um repetitive or, or boring but it, it was fortunately somewhere along the line i don't know how or why i i was gifted with the common sense or if it's not common if it was common everyone would have it um of of knowing when to shut the f up 
um, and realizing that there were going to be situations where I was going to come out of them a thousand times better by not saying a word and just soaking everything up. And that was a huge benefit for me on so many levels. Um, and look, there are times in life where it's time to control the room, control the floor, control the narrative and, you know, and, and, and lead the conversation for sure and take charge. But you want to be aware there's a time and a place. You don't want to do it just to fill air. So many people, this is like, a, I mean, when you talk about like a real, you know, pandemic, it's, it's the pandemic of humanity, which is diarrhea of the mouth. And people just speak and use words and fluff and fill the air because silence makes them uncomfortable. And it's very easy to figure that out quickly with someone. And, you know, don't be uncomfortable being silent. Don't be afraid to be quiet. Um, I always tell people who work with me that my favorite three words are, I don't know. I love when someone says, I don't know, to a question I ask, if I ask for information, if I'm asking for specifics on something, because when someone says, I don't know, Presumably, that means they, they know they need to go get the correct answer and I can have confidence in it. When I am getting information from someone who time and time again always has something right off the top of their head and shoots it out, I become really aware. And as I, I keep an extra eye on them and it, it's without fail, pretty quickly I realized that 70% of the, of the information is, is, is BS, they don't know. And they're not, they're not trying to make it up, they're not trying to be deceitful, but, but they have been conditioned in, in life and in society that if your boss or anyone asks you a question, it's almost your responsibility to have an answer to say something. And, you know, like for me, you know, I'm running out of space, but uh, at some point, maybe one of my tattoos will be, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, that's great. That's right. <clears throat> what has been one of the biggest things you've had to overcome and work on? Man, how many hours you got? Um, <laughs> y you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin with that one, but I'll try. I think, um, look, I think everybody, you know, you're either going to be a narcissist where you have such an inflated sense of self, uh, and that's a whole separate area to go down and there's nothing good that comes of that on any way shape and form but there's a lot of people that fall into that or you're going to somehow along the way need to develop confidence and reassurance within yourself um and comfort in your own skin and and those are things i remember so much that man i i so badly wanted to snap my fingers and have it and i knew i lacked it and i would go into meetings as many years ago nervous, shaking. I would hear it in my voice. I would practice in the mirror. I would do all the things you're supposed to do. And then all of a sudden the meeting would start and people would walk in and what would be in my head would be, don't fuck this up. Don't fuck this up. Don't mess this up. Don't fuck this up. You know, I talk about it in the book, my, my big audition in Reno when I was a TV news producer and I really wanted to be an on-air reporter. This was my life's goal as a kid. I went to school for a degree in this and you know, I was in my early 20s, and finally they gave me my big shot to audition. And in my mind, instead of doing what I knew how to do, what I'd practiced and what I had down, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, don't fuck this up, don't fuck this up, you've been waiting. And I, was, I say in the book that I'm surprised the first words out of my mouth were, hi, I'm Drew Plotkin, don't fuck this up, we'll be back after this. And I didn't say that, but it was almost as bad. Um, and, and, you know, and that was the end of that. I mean, I just told, and, you know, think of it, I mean, you know, if, if, if the guy going up to the, to, to the plate in the ninth inning and there's, you know, two on and, and two out and, you know, he, he's basically the deciding batter. If this guy is walking up there sharding himself, thinking in his mind, if I strike out, I've embarrassed my family, the city, my life is over. My parents drove me to practice from the age of six, all the sacrifice. You know, and and alternatively, you know, you can, you know, walk up with the utmost confidence of, you know, looking at the pitcher. It's me and you, bitch, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, let's go. Let's do this. And I remember speaking to someone years ago about, you know, the psychology of, of golf in specific. And I was always interested in sports psychologists and the role that they play and, you know, basketball players and athletes when someone's in the zone or not in the zone. And, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it made a lot of sense to me that, that at that top level of golf, um, you know, someone had said that the difference between, you know, like the top 10 in the world and like the top 10 teaching pros at most country clubs that, you know, um, is really separated by that level of 
comfort, confidence, reassurance, breathing. Um, and it was interesting. They were talking at the time that they, that if you look at some of the, you know, records at different golf clubs around the country, oftentimes the records on some of these golf courses are no names that you've never heard of before. Phenomenal, incredibly skilled golfers with skill, technique, execution. And on a typical tournament, when there's, you know, not NBC or CBS and all the lights and cameras and millions of people and you're playing in the Masters and, you know, this putt is on the line, that is night and day different. Where if you're, you know, an amateur or a club pro and you're out playing and you're in the zone and you're not sitting there going up for that putt or that drive on the 18th with that level of anxiety or everything on the line. And so I think, I think that those types of things are, are I, I would play mind games with myself like that. That was helpful for me. I would visualize, I did a lot of visualization, you know, coming through with a positive outcome. Um, you know, those types of things. And then also reminding myself after some really big failures coming to grips with, you know, I'm, I'm going to fail stuff for the rest of my life. Do I really want to feel this way for the rest of my life? Do I really want to, you know, be walking the ledge to the edge of the building every fucking time something doesn't go my way? That that does not seem like a happy way to exist. And And so it was coming to terms with that with myself as well. So, oh man, Drew, that is amazing. As a as a recovering people pleaser addict for four <laughs> decades, that's fire skinny. I, I was a people pleaser for most of my life until the last four years. And my life for four decades, dude, was consumed of, well, what does Drew think of me? What does Nancy think of me? What does Bob think of me? What is and now, thank God, as I've been working, you know, on my emotional fitness program, I, I don't care what Drew thinks of me. I don't care what Susie thinks of me. I don't care. Like, yeah. obviously, I, 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 I would now I, I, I value if Drew digs me, but my identity doesn't revolve around whether Drew digs me or not. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so and, and you also you eat more of that responsibility yourself. Like, I'll think to myself, you know, if, if someone isn't into me, but I've been my genuine self and I've been a good person. And I think I have a clear sense of, you know, what, what's morally a decent way to treat people at this point. Um, you know, then, you know, I know, Hey man, I'm an acquired taste, take me or leave me. Most people do. I could live with that. There, there are times where I will look back on a situation, maybe right after it happened, or maybe a year or two later with, with some more wisdom and growth and be like, I wasn't, I wasn't the person in that dynamic that I could have been or should have been or what I would have liked to have been. I see their perspective more, but, but it's based on me and how I've behaved and my, my understanding of that versus needing that acceptance of every person that walks in the room just because, and that's just a, not a good way to go through life. You know, I like what you said, a recovering people pleaser. That's right. That's right, dude. And, and, and I'm, you know, probably 90, 95% healed and, and have worked through all that stuff and there's probably i probably still have a little bit more left in there but man it was brutal dude it was brutal way to live trying to seek validation and affirmation and approval from everyone around me it was just brutal i, I feel uh, like if, if you like have meetings you know where it's like people pleasers anonymous you should all stand and say your name and then all at once go fuck you you know and i think that should be like the big step towards you know overcoming <laughs> Right, right. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know. Okay. So uh, on. So this is kind of another people thing. So you've you've interacted with and had some exposure with some you know pretty senior, high up, big ballers, celebrities, whatever you know, influencers, whatever you want to call them. What what did you observe? Or so I guess two two things. One is what did you observe? about those type of people, number one. Number two, how were you able to be as effective as you were with that level of, of person? There's two different questions in there. For me, I think the reason I was effective and, and it kind of continued on and uh, became kind of a, a thing that we were, you know, in, you know, working with lots of celebrities and pro athletes and it's kind of its own little world, you know, is my approach was very different. I, I knew that, you know, that they had, you know, a thousand handlers and yes men and yes women around them and all those different things. And, and, you know, whether they wanted it themselves or sometimes they might look up and that's just what happens and naturally gravitates around you managers, agents, you know, they're all setting it up and different things. And, you know, so I didn't really look at it 
out of the gate from that perspective. And I've, I've always tried to not judge a book by its cover, but for me, that just gave me the opportunity to be more myself. Um, if, if, if 15 people were standing around someone saying, you look so amazing, you're so wonderful. Every word you say is magic. Oh my God. How did you do that? They already got 15 people saying that they didn't need a 16th. Um, so that was kind of my own past to myself to be me. And what I actually found uh, over and over again, um, is especially in that world is that generally people appreciated that they 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 started to realize that they were going to get a valid honest opinion from me um they they trusted you know and i think that that was a big thing i was able to you know really earn trust with people because instead of they're halfway through a sentence saying what's important to them and most people saying you got it you got it you know it's all done well it couldn't be they didn't even finish the sentence and i remember being on a conference call with the with the pretty big celebrity a list celebrity i don't know like four years ago three years ago and um we had been prepped you know before the call by the team and the agents and the managers and all the people involved and the handlers and you know oh this person's gonna you know go off and, and this and that and they're gonna be very demanding and they're gonna want this and want that and here's the best we can do and make sure that you know our budget is to spend this to build this and just tell them this this and this and make sure to get off the phone happy that's all that matters is they get off the phone happy today and you know my whole thing was well if if we're not being honest with them you know and then they're going to show up in a week and and show up and see that something isn't what was agreed to you know and and b let's let's give them a little bit of credit here and, and think that we can speak to them like a human being um and i'm sure there's some people in the world that you can't speak to that way and that's okay if we come to that bridge we'll address it um, and I remember being on that call and a certain topic came up and everybody on the other side, you know, the talent side, the business side, uh, we were hired, you know, for this as the director, producer agency. And um, and they were muddling everything. And I remember it, it wasn't accurate what they were saying. And the celebrity basically said to everyone, you know, and not really rude. I'd have been more upset. Can everyone please shut up? Stop. Stop talking. Stop talking. I want to hear from Drew. And she asked me a simple question and I gave an answer. And I said, so basically, as I explained it and, and, you know, and she said, okay, so it's not exactly what I asked for. I said, it's not, it's about 90% what you asked for, how we're going to build it, how we're going to set it up. I go, here's the reasons why. And I explained, you know, the amount of hours in a day, the crew, the efficiency, and what that final difference, what it really meant, what we would trade in return for it, that ultimately we were going to get a very a better result. This person was going to be more happy. And I remember them just saying, you know, I, I would have preferred that everyone had been honest from the beginning, but I, I could totally live with what you're saying. And I appreciate someone at least giving me an honest answer. And, you know, we ended up having a very good relationship and, and, you know, had a very good shoot. And there was a lot of trust that was established on that. And, um, it, you know, it's just, if it's in you, it's in you. And, you know, if you, you want, it's easy, it's easier to bullshit people, um, you know, but that's just in the bigger picture. I, I just have never really been, um, a fan of that. I, I can sense it a mile away when people do it with me. Um, so, you know, there, there's that part of it. And then I, I think the second part of your question is what my take on, on, you know, celebrities and athletes and, you know, it, it's so funny. I, I never had a, a care for it. It wasn't like I came out to Hollywood hoping to work with celebrities. I know. So it probably worked out better because as I ended up in that world, there wasn't a star struck factor for me. There was never, you know, it was people or people and and people would always ask me, you know, what's so-and-so like, what's this, per you know, and, you know, I, I wouldn't get into specific dirty laundry about individuals, but the truth of the matter is some people were great and some people were assholes, just like anything else in life. Um, you know, if I walk into, you know, Walmart right now and talk to 20 people, some are going to be great. Some are going to be assholes. And that's right. You know, you know, I mean, is there a tendency when someone's ego is so inflated and they've been given everything on a silver platter and surrounded by a world of people who won't say no to them? Does that have a tendency to take over someone? Of course it does. I mean, it, it impacts people and you can see that, but at the end of the day, um, I, I've worked with celebrities and, and pro athletes, some of whom are some of the greatest people and, uh, you know, far more professional and, and great than, you know, struggling actors who you would think would <laughs> be much better uh, uh, behaved on a set. So it's all I, I think it comes down to who the individual is. Yeah, no, that's great. Now, how did you make the transition or, or maybe why? Because, if, you know, from the entrepreneur, you know, I've been a 25 year entrepreneur. Why did you make the pivot from? you know, your, your agency 
to Durham dude? That's a great question. You know, we were blessed with a lot of successful campaigns over the years. And, you know, we look, we worked with, you know, T-Mobile and, um, you know, Jockey and, and, you know, big brands. We worked with a lot of public companies and, you know, I think we, we tried to run a loose tally at one point and we did roughly about 1.5 billion in gross sales products and services for the combined brands we worked with over the years. So we, we definitely had a lot of success and it was one of those things where, yeah, part of it was monetary. I mean, we did well. I mean, nobody should cry for us, but we didn't own the brands. And as much as not owning the financial upside, we also didn't have the financial risk at the time. Uh, but it was that ability to make all of the decisions that I wanted to, not in a silo. I never wanted to go sit in the room and say, I'm going to come up with 15 ways to do this with Durham, dude. I'm not going to show anyone. I'm just going to say, implement it, go. That's about the opposite of, of how Durham dude works. And if I did it that way, we would have failed miserably out of the gate. Um, it wouldn't have worked. But what I wanted was that ability to be the final decision maker, um, to collaborate with great people to bring a vision to life that didn't have to go through um, several teams on each side, several rounds of, you know, those people in the world who talk to fill dead air. Um, you know, I wanted to make decisions in a small circle of, of people who I trusted. And, you know, even if I don't go with their opinion, um, it's still a very valid opinion and, and maybe something that I circle back to or not versus that, that game of, you know, um, uh, big brands. Once you come into them, they're already political by nature. So I wanted to develop a brand that I was close to. We did tons of women's skincare, hair products, personal care, which was great. Um, but I was getting closer to 50. My tattoo passion was increasing uh, it was getting more expensive. I was like, man, I wish there was some way to monetize this. Um, you know, I'd been in the world of skincare and skincare products and development for so many years with other brands and labs and formulators and dermatologists. And, uh, you know, really the stimulus was developing a tattoo line out of the gate. Uh, we, our first products were our tattoo balm, um, our, our spray, our SPF, our brightening spray. And then very quickly we realized, all right, there's success in this. We're, we're seeing some momentum. We really can't like build a big brand with a long future only doing tattoo. Um, I mean, there's a market for it and we're passionate about it, but what do we, you know, so, so very quickly, like almost a month after launching tattoo, we really hit the gas on beard. Um, and that was a, a very good natural evolution. And probably a few months after that, we, we rounded it out with our balls category. And, and, you know, all kidding aside, I mean, no pun intended, balls was big. It blew up for us. Um, I always tell the story, but it's true, is that I, I'm not, you know, a tech person. I'm not social media overly savvy. And I'm more than probably most people in the sense that I'm, I'm in that world day to day. But if you were out, go out and hire someone as a social media specialist, that's what they do. They would talk circles around me all day long. So I, I really was not a big fan of, of TikTok because I didn't understand it. I didn't know it. I was like, man, come on, another thing to learn. Oh, man. One day my six-year-old twins were like playing. I'm like, what are you guys doing? They're like, well, we're doing TikTok, daddy. And I'm like watching them. I'm like, and how do you put that in? You know. So like about a week later, I was sitting right here and a friend of mine was came to the office. And I, I honestly was not even fully aware that we were filming the whole thing. And he asked me about some of our products. And I just started to explain to him our ball products. And I was like, this is our, you know, ballgasmic ball, you know, sack wash, it's charcoal activated. And, you know, because it's gentle on your sack. And, you know, it has Dioplex, which is a natural ingredient for deodorizing. And I would, and I wasn't selling them. I was, I was just sharing like with a friend, I'm like, this is our happy sack nut love cooling cream. And, you know, and he was like pissing in his pants over. And he's like, tell me about whatever. He's like, so I get, I get jock itch and whatever. And my, I'm always wet and damp down there. It gets hot. I'm like, that's what, and you know, so, and I'm like, this is our amaze balls, you know, ball spray for the deodorizer that you put on afterwards. And, you know, we have different scents. This one's candy cane because it's Christmas season now. So you can have your balls smell like candy cane. I'm not going to spray it on my balls while we're filming as a favor to everyone watching. Um, and they were taping it and they put up like a 30 second video or less on, on TikTok a few days later. I never even watched the edit of it. I didn't know. And then literally I, I looked at the thing and it had like 300,000, 400,000. I mean, we had like no followers at the time. I mean, so it was like, and then I went to bed that night and it had like 900,000 views. And I woke up by like lunchtime the next day, it had like 1 1.4, 1 1.5 million 
views. People were subscribing to our page. And, and so we're like, all right, there's something here. <laughs> so uh, ever since uh, we kind of, we sit here, we have our wall behind us and, you know, sometimes I'll have a doctor on and we'll talk about stuff. We'll talk about different products. It's not always about products. It's, you know, we have a video that we just put out about tattoos and pain, you know, what areas are more painful than others or how to, how to pick a good tattoo art. So we try to be, you know, real and genuine and informative. We try to be like a hub for, for guys and dudes that can really, you know, get information on, proper hygiene, men's grooming, but in a fun, funny way, we try to be irreverent because I'd rather make someone laugh and and stop and look than shout or do something, you know, vulgar or stupid. And we like to have fun with it. You know, we, you know, one of our slogans for our ball products is that great smelling balls are a win-win. Um, but it's all rooted in, in the truth, the reality. And, you know, it, you can't make everyone happy. I'm sure some people would, you know, be offended. And if you are, that's no problem. There's a million other brands out there, you know, but, um, you know, we refer to ourselves as a non-apologetic brand. And what I mean is if we make a mistake, we'll say, we're sorry. We'll be the first. I mean, we, we make mistakes. I mean, I, I think earlier today, so we had a few orders that we shipped that we just screwed up somewhere along the line, whether it was the fulfillment center in another state or us here, whatever it was, we shipped the person the wrong thing. And we are very apologetic and we make it right and we do right by someone. But as far as, you know, what we say and how we talk about, you know, guys and taking care of our balls and some of the references and jokes that we make and innuendos, you know, they're not vulgar. They're never, if anything, we're self-deprecating. We're very inclusive. I always say the only people who would not be welcome at our table are the people who try to make other people not feel welcome. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's what I mean when I say, you know, non-apologetic and, you know, I, I think on our website, people laugh because we have a scented body wash and, you know, it says, uh, life is full of assholes. Don't smell like one. Um, and it's the truth. I mean, tell me the last time you went through a day in your life where you didn't bump into an asshole. Um, you know, and I'm not calling any one guy out. I'm not putting a picture of a guy who, who, you know, i didn't really get along with it. Starbucks last week and saying, this is Steve. He's an asshole. I mean, we're not singling people out. I might've been thinking of him when I came up with that line, but nobody knows that, you know, but it just, it kind of makes you stop and think, you know, and that's then right. Once they stop and think it gives us the opportunity to share, you know, Hey, we've been in skincare for 15, 20 years. Here's our formulas. Here's what's unique. Here's what, and the biggest reaction we get from people is I can't believe that these products are as good as they, like, we just thought it was like funny marketing. We thought you're probably like reselling someone else's under a different label. Then you're like, no, every product we sell for the most part has been about a year of development with labs and formulas and testing. And we go through 50, 60 iterations myself personally, then my team going through and then, you know, sampling to people and testing. And, you know, it, it's, it's a full, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's a real brand, <laughs> real science, real formulas, uh, our, our five-star ratings are, are off the charts and, uh, and, you know, it's great. We, we listen to, we listen to our tribe. You know, we always, I always say that we developed Derm Dude for myself, a 50 year old guy with, with balls, beard tattoos, and, and we developed it for every other guy out there. So we kind of look at it as communal. That's awesome. That's great, Drew. That's great. Okay. So how do we wrap it up here, Drew? How do we find you? How do we follow you? How do we stay in touch? Yeah. So the best way is as simple as is go to dermdude.com. So D E R M as in derm for your skin, derm dude, like, Hey dude. So dermdude.com. And from there, I mean, you can see we have a site on there called the man cave, which is fun. Uh, tons of like blogs and informative stories. You can check out some of our, our derm dude ambassadors. We just uh, have a, a guy uh, called uh, the crazy Hawaiian. He's a slap fighting champion with a mega beard. So he's part of derm dude now, and he's on our website and you can, you know, see us hanging out with him. Um, and, uh, all of our social links are on there. TikTok is a major hub for us. Um, you know, I, I don't count, but at last someone told me, I think we were at about 110,000 people following us on TikTok, which is again, fun since a short while ago, I didn't even really, had never been on it. Um, and you know, Instagram, we're on all of those. Um, so it's a great way for us to communicate directly. And if you want to check out the book under my skin, we love that. You can find that on our website. You can also find it on Amazon, but, uh, if you get it off of our website, I can sign it for you. So you can go to dermdude.com and, 
And the book is a, uh, it's a ride, man. It's a roller coaster. Okay. What, and I'll have all that on the, in the show notes. What's the number one message you want your audience, the audience to get from your book? Yeah. In the book, it's literally where I talk about peaks and valleys of my own lives, I, of my own life. I talk about, you know, a lot of my own failures, a lot of my struggles. I, I share things that I've never shared with people in my life in the book, which is a unique thing to do. And, and you're kind of like really putting yourself out there. I, I talk about suicides and and uh, people close to me and, 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 and a lot of different things. I think what people would be surprised is, is that you, you, you are reading one moment, some really deep, heavy shit where you're like, man, this is, this is some fucked up stuff. And then two, two pages later, you're laughing your ass off at some real life situation I was in. Um, but the real takeaway is that, um, you know, there, there's no magic wand to it. You know, for me, like anyone else, I want it. I want the peaks. I want to be in the peaks as much as possible, but coming to realize that it's what I observe and learn in those valleys is what gets me back to those peaks faster and more often. So instead of being so miserable or saying, woe is me when you're in a valley, take a breath, look back and say, what is it in this valley here that's going to get me back to that peak quicker and faster and for a longer period of time? And that that's what I tried to do in the book and share, share how, how my own roadmap is, is played out that way. Love it. That's great. I, I just did a series of three episodes it, the, about a few months ago about how I'm trying to reframe how I view my valleys. And, and rather than trying to run from them as quickly as possible, how can I learn from them? That's right. And it sounds like your book is a lot of your lessons learned and, and some really neat insights and stuff. Drew, cannot thank you enough, bro. You rock like ZZ Top. <laughs> totally appreciate you, brother, and really hope we can stay in touch. Let's do it, gangster. Let's do it, man. We'll hook you up for your beard. <laughs>